Welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. Up here at Crest Creek again, I'm going to talk uh, some more about the various attributes and themes and ideas of God. Layer of volcanic ash. That uh, gray cap right there, they say, was from three million years ago. It erupted three million years ago. That's quite the cap. It's a long time ago. That one, when you're hiking up this nature trail, you can see the various layers of the volcanic ash along the hillside. There's more of that uh, gray ash from three million years ago. You see how much rubble and land and stuff is above it. So it accumulated in three million years. I'm going to talk about the uh, talk about the scripture John 4:24. God is spirit, Theos from the Greek. Share with you some ideas and themes on the uh, the kind of God that is uh, understood to be in the Bible. It's a, a terrific subject. I've got some wonderful, wonderful commentaries and ideas and themes and books that I'll share with you. Some ideas. Some LDS, some not LDS. Fun to study the scriptures out in the wild. It's a beautiful day today. There's a, there's a little bird enjoying himself today. I think one of the uh, strongest commentaries on all of Scripture, as far as that goes, is a text I have with me by Newman and Nida, a translator's handbook on the Gospel of John. It's by the UBS, the United Bible Society. Very, very interesting what they say about John 4.24 I want to share with you. This is uh, Newman and Nye's book. I do believe it's a 1980 text. It's a very big text. It uh, discusses the various nuances of the Greek in the New Testament and how we can understand the, uh, the nuances, the semantic range of uses of the words, how they translate, how they don't translate, so on and so forth. And that John 4... 24 on page 122, they note that the translation, the theme of, of translation, we seem to have this tendency to believe literally what we read when we read the English uh, New Testament and the English Old Testament. But translation has its limitations, they say. There are points at which the full implications of certain theological terms must depend upon the teaching and the ministry of the church. However, it is the responsibility of the translator to render these terms in a way that will provide the clearest possible understanding of their meaning by the reader. The English version of John 4.24 translates, by the power of God's Spirit. It's a means of instrumentality. They say, the true worship of God is in spirit and truth. And that is why God is telling the woman, God is spirit. Pneumohotheos. This is the spirit of God. The clause, God is spirit. It's relatively easy to speak about the spirit of God, or his spirit, they say. But to say that God is spirit may cause difficulty for the use spirit is essentially a designation of quality and character is unusual. Now this is interesting. They say in translating God is spirit, I'm going to go to their appendix because they discussed in detail the use of the words spirit and truth. Aletheia is truth, Panuma is spirit. Way back on page 656, here's what they say about John 4.24. The word meant to them, that is, the Jews of Jesus' day. Now, we're used to reading this word, spirit, 
back onto the New Testament with our modern biases with the welding of Greek Neoplatonic philosophy. I've said that before in several of my videos. But that is how we read the scriptures. We need to get back to what the original actually meant. And the only way to do that is indicate, study, understand, comprehend how the term is used and what it means throughout the scriptures in its various contexts. This is called the semantic range of usage of each and every single word. Well, that takes enormous amounts of time and effort. And that's what this translator's handbook is here to do, is to help us do that. What they say about God as spirit is utterly fascinating. It's what we LDS have been saying all along. They say the words meant to them that God was spirit as opposed to matter. Doubtless, this reflects the understanding of the majority of English readers who have occasion to read these words. That spirit is the opposite of matter. But this is evidently not what the Johannian author intended for them to be taken. This is not discussing God's ontological nature as opposed to the nature of man, as so many people think. When it says God is spirit, that is not the opposite of matter, even though English readers read it that way. That's not the original intent of the Greek whatsoever. And I think that's utterly fascinating how they say that. On page 660, they note, Spirit in the Old Testament is regularly not an order of being against matter. Are you getting this? This is very important. Spirit in the Old Testament is not an order of being against matter, but what spirit is, what spirit means in the Old Testament. And remember, John, Peter, James, Jesus, Paul, what they had was the Septuagint for their scriptures, the Old Testament in the Greek. And in the Old Testament, spirit means life-giving. It means creative activity. And it is in this sense that John, John commonly uses the Greek word pneuma. God is asserting his creative and his life-giving power. We are a spirit. Ein pneumati draws attention to the supernatural life. It is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. That's why Jesus goes on to tell the woman, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes, that is because it is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. It is a life-giving, creative essence, force, that we are communicating with. It is not saying God is an immaterial, incorporeal being as against material. And that's Newman and Nida. They're two of the very best Bible translators. So let me explore some more on this subject, discussing various nuances of other scriptures from other LDS scholars that I think you will find extremely entertaining and interesting and enlightening. Eugene Sage's book, The Ancient Texts and Mormonism, Discovering the Roots of the Eternal Gospel in Ancient Israel and the Primitive Church, I have his uh, second revised edition for 1995. It's over a thousand pages. Unfortunately, he never got it published while he was alive. Someday someone might take up the cudgel. He's talking about how John uses God's glory to describe the synonymous with the fullness, because, of course, in John 1.16, he equates the sharing of the divine fullness and of his fullness. We have all received grace for grace, he says, with the sharing of the divine glory in John 17, 22. And of course the Gnostics use the pleroma, the fullness, as a terminus technicus for the light of the heavenly world as it emanates from God and it fills the angelic shapes and all that jazz. Several commentators have in fact suggested that the meaning contained in the New Testament concept of pleroma is exclusively applied to God himself. Nevertheless, his pleroma was complete because it contains God's images and his divine attributes. Now this is interesting because the French writer De Fay, he defines the basic meaning of fullness as Godhead without God himself. 
In other words, Godhood in the abstract.